Hello, everyone who has been just joining. Hi, Vinit. Hi, Dorian. Hi, Eleonore. Very warm welcome to our Decoso meeting. We are sure. Hi, Dorian. Lovely to see you. Um, surely, uh, further people will join in the course of the day at noon uh, here. I'm speaking from Dresden. It's 3 p.m. Uh, Berlin time. And we are gathering different time zones here around our screens. And around the Decoso meeting, my name is Doreen Mende, and I'm very, very warm welcome and very gladly to say a few words at the beginning of the Decoso meeting that has been organized and coordinated primarily by Lea Marie Nienhoff, one of the researchers, the doctoral researcher of the research project Decolonizing Socialism and Tangled Internationalism. It's an academic research um, project that's been uh, funded by the uh, National Swiss Science Foundation. And it continuously collaborates with artistic and curatorial initiatives, um, museum, art institutions, but also collectives and artists. So it's a transdisciplinary research that is going on for the last years. And we are aiming to develop a vocabulary to understand what decolonizing socialism could be. And at this moment, what we could crystallize is uh, decolonizing social, socialism means to denationalize socialism, to de-isolate so a very specific socialism crossing East Germany, the German Democratic Republic, and also to widen the space between the global Cold War binarisms of East-West and North-South as forms of entanglement, so decolonizing socialism also is a way to debinarize um, the idea, the political project of socialism through practices. Because uh, decolonizing socialism, what we also engage with is to figure out how does a state macro-political structure of a communist socialist project is crossing and composing um, a condition or like relates to forms of micro social practices that show themselves through artistic, experimental, architectural, architectural uh, constellations and forms of articulation. So this is where we are now. And we are pretty like in the second half of our research project. We still have a one and a half a year to go. And we have different case studies. I mean, most of you, of course, know the project, just, you know, a little tiny update on our website. You find our, our case studies and VNet has been involved with the, the one case study and we'll continue on that. But also I'm really happy to um, introduce very briefly also our team of decolonizing socialism. Lea Marie Nienhof, I already mentioned, our doctoral researcher who will chair the session. Ozean Vireveyak, our research coordinator, who is uh, coordinating the different activities and also scenes between Geneva, um, Berlin, and Dresden. And we are entering a new phase uh, this year where we will collaborate like with partners, artists, curators elsewhere, like with Wienet, for example, we collaborate on a research uh, project that will be exhibited in early 2024 in Dresden at the Albertinum. So that's really exciting. We have developed different also methodologies of research and that uh, aim to, to respond to the question of decolonizing and to once more de-isolate the German Democratic Republic as a political project in the 20th century in the condition of the global Cold War through like counter and counter counter perspective. I'm like profoundly happy and really glad that uh, Leah uh, decided to invite uh, a brilliant scholar and thinker intellectual from Chile, David Marlene who is going to present today his years-long research on cybernetics, political infrastructures, internationalism. And the talk has the title Cybernetics for a Front, a Latin American World Model on Cooperative Development 
represented in the buildings for the United Nations Conference for Trade and Development Number no. 3 that took place in Santiago de Chile in April 1972. And David's uh, presentation will be responded by Kenny Kupas, our dear colleague, and also a member of the advisory board of Decolonizing Socialism, and also advisor of uh, the PhD. Lea is doing, um, Kenny Kupas is professor and holds the chair of urban studies at the University in Basel. And it's been a profound pleasure to be in conversation. Kenny is working on um, urban infrastructures, territorial design in the so-called global south, specifically in the African continent around uh, large scale cities like Lagos. And very also um, speaking to those questions we are interested in also in decolonizing socialism. And um, I'm sure we will get to entangled internationalism in the following talk um, by David and the response by Kenny. And of course, you are more than welcome to join in with questions. I should say the um, session is recorded. And if you would not like to appear with your uh, with the, with, with the, the uh, transmission of your image, please, you know, kindly maybe switch off the camera or tell us we can do this also otherwise. And the same with audio, if you don't want to appear with your voice, you know, the chat is open, we can ask questions, we will slightly edit the recording in order then to make it public on our website of Decolonizing Socialists and also archive it for future researches. And uh, without further uh, kind of words, I'm happy to hand over uh, the screen to Leah for introducing more in depth the session. And um, happy to be in conversation uh, soon. The whole session will take about an hour and a half. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. And um, also welcome from my side. Um, before I will introduce David Malden, I want to kick us off with a few preliminary thoughts. Um, just prior to our session today, I reread Ilyal Musafa's acclaimed dissertation of 2007 titled The Periphery Within, Modern Architecture and the Making of the Third World. And therein, Musafa argues that too often in the critique of the post-World War II development agenda, scholars have focused on economic analysis, the role of the World Bank, etc. That, however, he claims design practices like architecture and planning have also played a significant role in shaping development discourse. So the implementation of urban planning tools and modern architecture in the so-called third world was accompanied by assumptions of urbanization and housing that transferred Western expectations of development and progress um, to the global south and in particular to, to Latin America. And thereby, Musafa demonstrates inaugurating a new era of global dominance and control. Yet he clarifies, neither can modernism be held simply responsible as a colonizing force, but sits in a diffuse terrain um, at the intersection with humanistic, social, and also nationalist agendas. And here I would like to pick up the thread. Um, as in this session, David will present a case study from 1972 in Chile that reflects an alternative discourse around development and adaptation of many of the socialist and avant-garde concepts of cooperative development and design which um, had been present, for example, also at the Bauhaus under the presidency of Hannes Meyer, and then traveling to Chile with a Meyer student, Tibor Weiner and, and others. But in fact, the discourse around design strategies and development present in Latin America in the 1960s and 1970s was connected to openly expressed demands to decolonize design um, as framed by Guy Bonsieppe, um, and also to the rejection of universals and the uh, awareness of Earth's limited resources as Thomas Maldonado expressed um, in the 1960s. So parallel to what Ilya Musafa describes as a UN-driven strategy to, to form and manage the, um, as he describes the urbanizing masses of the third world, um, where projects, existed projects and experiments um, uh, that understood design as a potential instrument to overcome dependency. 
So therefore, um, the experiments in socialist democratic Chile um, need to be regarded in their own terms and uh, also in aiming to decolonize socialism um, as this is part of uh, the project's title, um, we should also ask in which uh, we should also ask which history and experiments have been forgotten through the neoliberal turn uh, in Chile and elsewhere. So that's why we are particularly happy to have David uh, speaking today about uh, UMTAD 3 and how its designers try to embed political values and an alternative vision for development in the design of the building. Um, to shortly introduce you, uh, David, David Moulin de los Reyes uh, teaches history of technology at the Metropolitan Technological University. He has published widely on the relationship between art, science, and new technologies in the context of social change, educational reforms, and urban planning, especially in Chile and Latin America in the 20th century. He curated the third Biennale of the National Museum of Fine Arts, MNBA, titled Situating of Chilean Contemporary Art, designed the project Genealogical Trajectories of Buildings for the Third United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD 3, and worked as regional curator at the IFA project, Everyone is a Bauhaus, Past and Future of a Concept at ZKM. He has contributed to the platform Is Modernity Our Integrity of the 12th Documenta in Kassel and was co-editor of the special issue on cybernetics in Latin America, published in Springer's AI and Society Journal. Um, and with no further ado, I would like to um, hand over to, to David. Okay. Up in the presentation, so? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Well, uh, good morning. Here is the, is the morning yet? Um, I'm happy for this invitation because uh, it's an amazing subject. At, at the same time, it's very difficult to talk about this here in the academic environment. And uh, I'm going to talk about the situation of uh, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development three buildings uh, made in Chile in the socialist government of Salvador Allende. Here you can see a plaque uh, from the United Nations, uh, disappeared plaque uh, uh, after the conference in Chile during the socialist government. And uh, here, uh, a picture from those years, a plaque made with stone because they want to express the building for the conference was not made by three techni techniques, was a collective result. This uh, plaque made in stone disappeared after the military coup uh, in 1973. What is a symbol of this? Then what happened if we search the cybernetics in Latin America in Google, uh, probably appeared the, the example of the famous CyberSyn project in the same years of UNCTAD, uh, in Chile, the conference UNCTAD. Or if we look about socialist cybernetics, usually happen a similar thing. Um, I have to say, uh, 10 years ago, nobody talked about cybersync here, only after 30 years of the military coup. But it's not the only history, because the history of cybernetics in Latin America starts in the 40s in Mexico with Rosenburg and continue even today. But obviously, it's a very important uh, example. And if you put a cyber scene in Google, usually the only picture you can see is the auto room picture, but it's not all about a cyber scene project. Um, but if you if we can try to understand what cyber scene was in the socialist government, uh, we can think about the same Google, and we can think how Terry Vinogard in the 90s talking, work, working with Sergey Brin and Larry Page, and they was uh, doing research about what to do with the Tim Berners-Lee uh, invent the 
and then they did uh, Google. And the connection is uh, in the late 80s, Terry Vinogard was working with the Chilean engineer Fernando Flores and the German designer Yvon Siep in California. And they did uh, support to private uh, industries uh, about how to use the computers. And this Chilean engineer in the 80s with Terry Vinogar in, in the 80s in the United States called to the German designer Gibbon Siep for work about uh, design of interaction. But in those years, in the 80s, um, Flores um, introduced to Bonsiep use another epistemological background with the autopoiesis concept from Maturana and Varela together with the ontological model from Heidegger. It's very strange because it's not the background what Bonsiep had in the 70s or 60s in HFG own was a change in this. Because when uh, Gibbon Siep, the German designer Gibbon Siep, uh, met Stafford Beer and Fernando Flores in the early 70s, the socialist government was another history. In those years, um, Fernando Flores was the main manager of the Chilean Development Co Corporation, a national corporation, uh, Corfo, and he convinced uh, to agenda to contract the second order cybernetician Stafford Bird for the management of the national industries. And uh, Givon Sieb was in Chile because the United Nations contract him for help to Chile to the na nation and the core for the National Production Development Corporation because they want to do uh, our design, industrial design. And the Corfo agency, INTEC, Technological Institute, where Givon Siep was working, worked with another Corfo agencies like ECOM, the national company, uh, and another uh, together was the framework for the CyberSync Corfo project. And the Givon Siep team, they did the interfaces for the uh, CyberSync project. But what CyberSync means um, was a model for the management of the new uh, industries or the old industries, but with the control from the state using the viable system model from the second order cybernetic from Stafford Beer and decentralized network where uh, each part of the system can take decisions to for himself. All in this experiment of uh, a different kind of uh, socialist government with Allende. Allende is, is a medical doctor. He understands the neurological model of the viable system model uh, easy. And um, the third interesting part of CyberSync project is a prospective model for the future of the economy at the same time. That is the simple um, five model of CyberSync from Stafford Beer uh, with the model from the central nervous system. And this is Stafford Beer when he arrived to Chile in the early 70s, like a second order cybernetic because the second order cybernetic began a few years in that moment when Margaret Mead began to talk about this in the late 60s. So, but the viable system all have three three parts, essential parts. Um, the management place, like the brain or the human, uh, then the environment, the external social or nature environment, and the organs of the body, the interfaces, the devices, so the operation space. When we have these three basic elements, we have a, a viable system model, the, the basic principle of the viable system model that Stafford Reed used in the industries, Chilean industries in the socialist government in the early 70s. But we can found after the Second World War 
in the National University, the University of Chile, uh, in the architecture school, there were a revolution inside the school from the students where they, they get at least a new model, the integral or the total architecture. And, and inside this, this triangle, curriculum triangle with three elements, the human being, with the free function uh, the functional decisions the management so uh, with the nature the environment social and natural environment then and the material the technology side and in one sense in one sense 25 years and before cyber project we can do a, some kind of interpretation they have some kind of uh, analogical uh, viable system model inside the curriculum in the National University for teaching architecture. Even uh, we can uh, see in the architectural analysis uh, workshop in the first and second years of the education of architecture. For instance, uh, Abraham Shapira explained the different uh, definitions of environment natural, technological, and human, you can see. And this was in 1948. Or for example, uh, Tibor Weiner, a um, former student and assistant of Hannes Meyer in HFG Bauhaus Dessau and then in Soviet Union, uh, helping to these uh, young architects in the University of Chile in the 40s, he teach the workshop of uh, architectural analysis in 1946 and 1947. And you can see the results of this <laughs> workshop with very molecular uh, interpretation of the housing. And another important uh, workshop or class in this new curriculum was the bioarchitecture class uh, invented by the medical doctor and communist uh, member of Chilean communist member, Jose Garcia Tello, he invented a bioarchitecture class, uh, like a complement of this curriculum. And the results in a social representational system was the concept of the city designing as a living si system or a living organism. Uh, they get in the 50s and 60s this was the interpretation for the design of the, the public human commons under this concept. The more uh, great example was the plan in 1960 for the city. That's the city where, um, where the, the building was made in the early 70s an organic system of the city. And um, in the front of this uh, building for the Confederation of the United Nations for found a possible alternative model for the Global South, we can find this uh, sculpture made by Carlos Ortuzar. Uh, it's a symbol of this fourth, fourth possible world because we, wa we was the, the third world <laughs> and we don't want to follow exactly the model from the first or second. Well, we were looking for a fourth word, and that's the meaning of these sculptures. All, all these um, sculptures or this building made in 10 months for this conference uh, changed after the military coup two years later, and all the artworks disappeared. So in April, 1972 was the international conference with more than 3,000 um, delegates. Um, one of them was uh, Siko Manshol, the president of the Economical European Commission. And for instance, he get a copy of the limits of growth from Donella Middle's team from the MIT uh, before it was published and he defended the idea of uh, the decreasing uh, was very interesting uh, 
approach, but among three three thousand or four thousand delegates, so no, we were not the only position. The the model of uh, Donella Meadow in MIT, the limit of growth, was made with the um, World Tree, mod, uh, the prospective computing World Tree model, and for instance, the cyber scene, the cyber scene project was made with the World Two model. So. But uh, you have to think uh, was not the only position. For instance, uh, the representative of the United Nations for the human environment, Maurice Strong, was a typical mining entrepreneur, for example. He, he is far from this position like another. So at the same time, one of the more important groups in this meeting was the G77. Uh, was formed a, a little before the second UNCTAD in India in the 60s. It um, was an aggregation, a, a kind of United Nations from the third world. So, and they did an, an a strong position in these meetings. At the same time, a little month, month after the conference in Chile, uh, in Argentina, the Bariloche Foundation did a strong critic against the model from Mido, the limits of growth, with the Latin American world model. Uh, they used to say answer to the made co MIT computer with computer from Argentina. So <laughs> the, the Latin American world model um, first critics the concept of growing because be thinking about how many you have each year, and that's not the device of the development because are the human needs. So, and then uh, they think the limit of growth is the point of view from the United States or from Europe, and it's not a global point of view. It, it's the strongest critics they do, and then they began to do a model uh, where the the um, world was divided in four zones and five uh, subjects. But especially, uh, they tried to do a model, a prospective model uh, from this uh, four uh, point of view at the same time. Uh, and not the growing was the principal device for critics or not was the human needs. That's why they were talking about housing, education, food, capital goods, and others. So that's the model that they did uh, from Argentina in the, in the 70s, like a critic to the limits of growth. Um, this uh, magazine made by the Friedrich Ever Foundation published a number in 1976, talking about these three subjects. The approximation from the cybernetic systemic uh, model. And it's interesting because uh, the bibliography have uh, some uh, Venezuelan cyberneticians, theoretical, and some uh, Russian <laughs> cyberneticians epistemology to, for, for, to do a definition of cybernetics in this magazine. Um, at the same time, in the same magazine, they, they did a timeline about the UNCTAD conference, the first in Geneva in 1964, the second in India in 1968, and the formation of the group of 77, etc. And, and after the, the Chigan meeting too, um, there were a good uh, article about the limits, the Latin American world model in the same magazine. I try to say it was was the same discussion together. So, and even in the seventies, we have three models, three prospective computational model maybe, the viable system model. First in this socialist government in Chile, but then uh, after the military coup in Chile, some people tried to do again an interpretation in Peru in 1974, then in Mexico in 1938. Then a successful example of uh, the viable system model in Uruguay in the 80s and later. So 
The second model may be the Latin American world model from Argentina in the 70s. After um, with the military coup in 1976, this work was finished. And there were a third model, the Numex, uh, who born in Argentina in the framework made by the cybernetician Argentinian Manuel Sadowski. But after the military coup in 1966, some of them from the team from Sadowski go to Chile and then Peru and Venezuela with this uh, Numex model. So, but some of them then change of idea and some of them then like uh, Amilcar Herrera was working in the Latin American world model in Bariloche or uh, Barsavsky began to use the Bialy system model in Peru, for, for instance. Well, a methodological parenthesis, uh, I like to use the sociology of symbolic production for the study of these timelines. Uh, one of my examples is the approximation that uh, Envesor did with identity, subjectivity, and representation, or how we uh, talk about cosmotechnics uh, telling technology is not an universal definition, or Slava Herovic uh, says cybernetics is not an universal definition. Uh, returning to the coincidence between the viable system model in the early 70s and the new architectural curriculum in the 40s, we can see how the COP design from Hannes Meyer was a very important influence in the 40s because the former student and assistant Tibor Berner in Chile in the 40s had to the students to do this new curriculum. This is the timeline of uh, Hannes Meyer uh, from Switzerland to Germany, then Soviet Union, then uh, Switzerland, Mexico and Switzerland. And Tibor Weiner from uh, his country to Germany, then Soviet Union. In Germany and Soviet Union together with Hannes Meyer, then in France, then in Chile. And uh, meanwhile, uh, Hannes Meyer was in Mexico, Tibor Weiner was in Chile, and they talk between, uh, they, they send letters about how to do a new education uh, in Latin America. Well, uh, he, he, get an, he came from the exile with all the group because uh, we know in the 30s, we have the popular front government in Spain, then with the civil war finished, and we have the popular government in the in France. Tibor Weiner go to Soviet Union to France one year, and then uh, in Chile we have a popular front government, and uh, our government give a political exile to the people from the Spanish Republic, and Tibor Weiner came in these conditions. The components of the COP design from Hannes Meyer, the more uh, famous so is the active school from Johannes Pestalozzi, uh, how to translate the cooperative uh, methodology in design methodology, the influence of the neopositivism from Vienna School. And both uh, Tibor Weiner and Hannes Meyer have uh, an own interpretation of the electrical materialism. We can see this in this curriculum, how they uh, are the interpretation of the COP design. Well, here we can see the results of the first years in the University of Chile with Tibor Weiner uh, again. And uh, after this reform in 1947, there are a very big meeting in Peru uh, with different schools from Argentina, from Mexico, from Chile. And they began to talk about a regional movement with these ideas. The lecture of the curriculum of Chile was made by the Jose Garcia Tello, the Chile teacher. Tibor Bainer had to go to his country again in the late of the 40s. And in the same year, 19, uh, 1948, the Chilean president decide the Communist Party is uh, illegal and was a very difficult uh, uh, situation for the people in the Communist Party. Uh, only in the architecture faculty was a place for a kind of resistance. We can see the, the bulletin made, the magazine made by the students with the ideas of Hannes Meyer, 
the bulletin New Vision. And uh, Tibor Berry can do uh, the socialist model of city, Duna Ubaros in the 50s. So one of the first uh, theses, the first project from the first generation of this new curriculum, for instance, was made by uh, Juan Honold, Pastor Correa, and Jorge Martinez with this epistemolog epistemological background from Patrick Yedes, Gaston Bardet, Levert, Abercrombie, and Manford. An interesting thing is. Uh, Honol uh, is a Protestant, uh, uh, and Pastor Carrera was Catholic. But these three students, with the teacher, the communist teacher Santiago Aguirre, they said we learned the dialectical materialist methodology from our teacher, and inside this dialectical materialist methodology, we can do a framework with this uh, Hedes, Bardet, Lebret, Abercrombie framework. So, in a three years, very very big project about how the city have to be designed. Uh, they did a very big exhibition in the main avenue in the downtown Santiago. Uh, and then the project was to the Ministry of uh, Urban Planning. What's a very, very <laughs> big uh, project. So uh, for the ministry contract them, some of them. And in the same year, the 19, 54, uh, there are a new law for the urban planning. One of the main from the local avant-garde, like the socialist Enrique Guevara, put inside the ideas of the Congress of Modern Architecture inside the new urban laws. Uh, then in 1957, we have a seminar, a meeting by six months, six months, <laughs> not six days, six months, talking how the cities have to be in the future. So, and uh, in those in that year, the dean of the Chilean Faculty of Architecture, uh, Hector Mardones, was elected the president of the International Association of Architects, and he had to be the director of the the Union of International Architect meeting in the Soviet Union, and Moises Bedrak a former assistant of Tibor Weiner and proper professor of University of Chile and communist member Partizo. Uh, he explained how the, the, main, the main resolution of the, of the Congress in Soviet Union is similar what they tried to do planning this city in Chile in this long meeting for six months about the next uh, 30 years. So, and then the peak of this moment about the design the city as a living organism or system was this uh, very big plan. So uh, the intercommunal regulatory plan of Santiago and, and other big cities. So where you can see how they were thinking how, like a system and a decentralized system for the city, organic system. But all this, project for 30 years was stopped in the 70s after the military coup in 1975 we changed the economical model the neoliberalistic model with the uh, Milton Friedman idea so and in the end of the 70s um, all these projects from the state was stopped disappeared the National Company of Computing, the National Technological Institute, every, every um, company from the state disappears or go to the private <laughs> property. And you can see how the Auka magazine designed how, how the free market uh, put uh, buildings in the, in the lands for the agricultural uh, activities. So it's, it's a disaster. So, and you can read how the people from the government believing in this new model, economical model, says the economy operates in the growth of the city, no feelings. And uh, the land and the housing change from an, uh, it's not more a right, it's, it's a common good. It's, um, it's something you can, you can buy it only. You, you are not more a citizen, you are a, a consumer. So that is the main change 
in education, health, and urban planning in the 70s and 80s in Chile, even today. But before this change, in the late moments of this parallel to CyberSync project, uh, in the first years of the socialist government, uh, Salvador Allende says, we are going to do uh, 100 housing in the first years, never in the history of Chile, no, nobody did 100 uh, uh, thousand housing in one year. And this, the a member of the Communist Party, the engineer, uh, Helmut Steuben, uh, they took uh, the model of the PERT the critical path method and the CPM model for the computing uh, follow of all the projects in the Ministry of uh, Urban and Housing. And uh, Moises Vedrak, the former assistant of Tibor Bani in the 40s, or this teacher of urban planning and communist, communist uh, member in the 50s, who was talking about in, in the Soviet Union, was um, the director of the urban development planning in this ministry. And he think what Helmut did was very good. And he said all the projects in our ministry have to use this mo model. The PERT and the CPM was made in the 50s and 60s uh, for do the missiles uh, Polaris and for the Apollo 11. But in the early 70s, uh, for example, uh, the pair was used by the Cybersync project too, by Stafford Beer at the same time. Uh, the CyberStrike, the software of Cybersync project, took the model of the pair and the CPM. It's a kind of a Gantt chart, but uh, you do a critical line of activities, and then you can calculate activities can be late one day, one hour, one minute and nothing happened with the critical path. So, uh, but uh, Helmut Steuben uh, thinks with his own interpretation of the centralized technology, um, he teach to the people working in the, in the UNCTAD buildings, the constructions, usually the buildings like they did uh, for the UNCTAD meeting, take three years and they did it in 10 months because uh, they use a kind of interpretation of the code design using computing. That's what uh, Stafford, uh, Helmut Steuben did. In one sense, uh, what the people is going to talk about in the conference in April 97, was 1972, was made in the practice with this uh, decentralized way or collaborative way for use the computing during these 10 months so. And after the meeting, uh, the buildings turned in a cultural center, but in another sense about uh, social cohesion uh, was the goal of this cultural sense. For instance, the unions or the students organization have priority, for, for example, the International Trade Union meeting was made in March 1973. And at the same time, the tower of these uh, buildings uh, turned into the women's tower, where uh, women from the north or the south of the country came to the, the capital city, the capital city, yes, for, for uh, learn about the economical and political situation of the country. At the same time, they, they learned technical and practical things. So. At the same time, uh, they did cultural activities about culture, but scientist, economic, regional cultures. And I am finishing so. Uh, at the same time, in the Technological University, we have an identity project. One of them was the project of Jaime Michelo and Inet Harding about teaching computing and programming in the public schools. So, and Inet Harding, for example, he is studying in Lomons, Lomonosov University in Moscow. For do this possible, we need this framework, national framework between the National Computer Company with the University of Chile and uh, University Technical University. So if we don't have this uh, framework, it's not possible this kind of project. So after the military coup, uh, 
they took the building like the the headquarters of the militars uh, the 25 years so <laughs> and today is a traditional cultural center so um in parallel in the 70s the Latin American model finished with the military coup in Argentina in 1976 when the project was began to be famous in another country so and between this uh, the Chilean architect published uh, a severe theory about the city and his systems and Tomás Maldonado published uh, in the New Vision publishing uh, an editorial made by Tomás Maldonado and in the same time Tomás Maldonado published uh, environment and ideology so in Spanish. Well, this is a very big, big, big history. Uh, here you can download uh, in open access uh, the, the research report in this uh, uh, link. And if you have any question about it, you have my uh, email, so thank you. Thank you so much, uh, David, uh, for this uh, telling us this complex uh, history. And um, I mean, it's impressive on how many different levels cybernetics and co-op design kind of principles fused. And uh, you spanning it from like cultural center, artworks, computing. Um, thank you so much. And with this, uh, I will hand over to, to Kenny. Um, to give his thoughts uh, on, the, on the research. Yeah, thank you so much for this very rich presentation. Um, and uh, I'm really uh, mind blown about the kind of complexity, but also the amount of you know, experiments that were taking place in this period. Um, and um, with that in mind, how uh, actively they must have been um, uh, kind of made invisible uh, in the period following. Um, and maybe that's the question I'd like to start with. Um, you mentioned prior to our conversation or to your public uh, presentation here that it's difficult to do this kind of history, to tell this kind of uh, history and have these conversations in, in universities in Chile today. Um, and I can imagine that has to do uh, a lot with the afterlives of the dictatorship and how that, that has um, dismantled um, intellectual production and, um, um, and let's say utopian experimentation or you know not so utopian, quite realistic, I guess, but uh, experimentation at the time. So I wondered if you can just give us a, a sense of the context um, after these experiments and how that has shaped your own position um, trying to un un unearth um, these, these histories. Well, um, I think an important point is a uh, neoliberalistic model is not universal either. So, and the neoliberalistic model in Chile or South America is not the same in South Korea, for, for example, or in Poland are, are different kinds of neoliberalistic models. So, and in Chile, uh, the neoliberalistic model was uh, very important in the 70s and 80s because with the new constitution and the new model, uh, the education, the health, and the etc. Et are things for buying. It's, it's not more a right. And that means, uh, for instance, today we have 60 universities, but they have to fight between them in the free market, even, even the public universities from uh, um, 30 40 years they have to fight between them in the in the free trade so uh, and and many people uh, think uh, uh, all people think with this model from the 80s um, uh, the public university have to disappear it's, it's very it's, we have a very strange model of public university because you have to pay in the same way than the private private universities so the, the the government doesn't give money to the public universities have only the surname from the past so and 
in the 80s, uh, at the same time, disappears many uh, agencies from the states because the, the core form made by the Popular Front in the 30s, they began national industries in the 30s. But in the 70s, with the new model, this disappears and disappears, for example, the, the National Computing Company or the Technological Institute were given the work it. So, but this was not invented, but in the early 70s by Salvador Allende, they came from an old uh, history from the 30s. So even Salvador Allende was a health minister in the popular from government in the 30s. So. And, and he worked with uh, modern architects inside the government in the popular front in the 30s. He understand the modernity is a social movement of change. It's not only a new form. So, and that's what he have this systemic model uh, for thinking. So um, that means, for example, uh, the Pinochet and the other generals took these buildings after a military coup, like the headquarters, they transformed these big cultural centers in a military bunker. So, and then from the 70s, in the 90s, when they read the return of democracy we have here, uh, the buildings go to the Ministry of Defense. It doesn't return to be a cultural center, continue under military use. So, and in night in um, um, 50 years, no, uh, 18 years ago, this building have a big, big fire. So, and many people were happy this building was destroyed because they think was made by Pinochet in the 80s. Uh, nobody knows was made in the Salvador Allende for a meeting for a model, alternative model for the global south. So nobody knows this. It was very interesting. And only after this fire, the people, some people began to talk about this past, but all these years, nobody talk about uh, because no, nobody, um, in the 70s, we have very strong uh, changes with uh, with the new regime. For example, uh, the the professional associations lose the power the the powers they have for change the laws. They lose this. Um, and talk about politics was dangerous in the 70s and 80s. And then the people have this. We don't have Pinochet in the presidential office, but. In the, in the 90s or, or then, but the people continue having fear to talk about political history. And it's very interesting because even today, you can look about how the cybernetics continue in uh, Uruguay in the 80s or Colombia in the 90s, but nobody talk about cyber scene project in Chile uh, before the book of Eden Medina, 30 years after the military coup. Thanks to Eden Medina, the, the, the people began to talk about cybersecurity projects in Chile again. And and we can feel this, all these kind of things um, yet today. Um, it's amazing for me, nobody write about the meeting in April 1972 in 50 years. <laughs> I can, it's very strange. In, in 10 or 50 years, the only text you can find the ninety percent of the text is about the artistic works made for the building. No, no more than. <laughs> it's very strange. So, but it's a it's environment where we we work about because the people have this uh, background from the nineties uh, where nobody wants to talk about the past because uh, continue the fear from the eighties. So. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, and actually, it was my my. Uh, job was to provide comments and not immediately attack you with further questions. So apologies for um, for doing that too fast. Uh, maybe I'll try to speak a little bit more generally to to your themes and feel free to jump in. But uh, don't uh, you can take as now perhaps as yeah. promised. Okay. Um, so uh, for me, it was interesting to read this architectural history against the background of more general, um, let's say, political history of this period. Um, uh, and you've kind of unearthed the 
or, or so the architectural dimension of it. Uh, the political dimension, I think um, uh, I first came uh, in contact with this story through the work of Johanna Bockmann on uh, socialist globalization, where she argues that Untat and others uh, were, were experiments in thinking about a kind of market-oriented socialism, um, so socialism of world markets, um, that was actually um, something that the Western powers were very much against because they would rebalance, they would create a new economic order, uh, right? As, as I think you uh, also um, have explained. Um, and how that then, there was a kind of revanchism in the 1980s uh, of trying to actively undo uh, UN, uh, UNTAT, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, um, and you know, with kind of a neoliberalism that was also a neo neocolonialism. Um, I think that's uh, an important uh, history for this project on um, decolonizing socialism because it uh, begs the question: How decolonizing was this moment of socialist globalization? If it was based on, um, you know, kind of like complete liberalization of recently colonized or now independent uh, countries, um, what kind of, you know, political epistemologies of, of, of liberation um, uh, were circulating uh, in this period, um, and how do they um, relate to uh, the kind of, you know, to an also an aesthetics, uh, like decolonial aesthetics uh, let's say, uh, because uh, one of the surprising elements of this story is, for me at least, when you look at the building, you don't necessarily see special about this, right? So I'm not surprised that people would say this looks like a, a Pinochet era building, or it could also be like a you know kind of a town hall in uh, in, in in Boston or um, a conference hall elsewhere, right? So maybe it's not so much about the form, but also the process. Um, and the cybernetics of planning that goes into it. Um, and so therefore the, re the relations, also labor relations, et cetera, that are, that are set up rather than the you know, aesthetics uh, as you know, object aesthetics as such. Um, and I wonder if you, yeah, maybe everybody, uh, we're not a big group here, can speak to, to this um, challenge because uh, uh, it relates not only to an aesthetic question, but also this technological question that you um, mentioned, which is technology, you know, the Yukui uh, quote that you gave, technology is not a universal, cybernetics is not a universal, I forget uh, which author you mentioned there. Now I'd like to um, find that name again. Um, but um, yeah, so, you know, thinking about what, what the aesthetics of modernism are, if they're also not universal and what that means in terms of the, the, the political and, you know, decolonizing force of this historical moment. Yeah. Uh, I, I can answer in, in three angles. Well, first, um, in, in the research report, you can see for instance, how the Chilean Hernan Santa Cruz go to the United Nations in the 50s, and he continued working in the 50s, 60s. Uh, he tried to, for instance, uh, Santa Cruz was uh, very important for the creation of the Economical Commission of the United Nations in Latin America, but in Africa and Asia too. And then in the 60s, uh, he worked together with the Argentinian economist uh, Raúl Previs for create uh, the UNCTAD and, and fight in the 60s uh, because they want UNCTAD was a platform where the fair world can can discuss uh, with the people from Europe and United States in similar conditions for new conditions for the global. Uh, trade and, and development, and and was very <laughs> was very difficult to do this because usually uh, uh, in the UNCTAD, in the first UNCTAD, uh, in and the second one and the third, etc. Usually the people say we we use a lot of money but we get nothing. <laughs> so <laughs> because uh, because um, 
it's very difficult, but Raul Previch uh, from Argentina or in the 60s or Santa Cruz from Chile in the 50s. Santa Cruz, for instance, uh, was a part of the first commission from the United States about what happened in South Africa in the 50s. So, And, and they did a report uh, about the human rights declaration from the United States, from the United Nations in the 50s. So, but was a Chilean in, in the United Nations. Uh, and they have to talk how to do this via Bu and born the UNCTAD uh, possibility in the 60s, where uh, everything was difficult for Raul Previs from Argentina and his partners from India trying to do this uh, organization, the UNCTAD, the, the department from the third world in the United Nations. So, and and in this context, born for instance, the group of seventy seven uh, was a very strong group in the sixties and seventy, and even exists today. And you can see this in these discussions. Oh, but for example, in in the UNCTAD, in the same UNCTAD, for me was interesting because it was not easy doing this in Chile, in South America. United States doesn't want the UNCTAD in Chile, or. Uh, that doesn't want the UNCTAD in Latin America. Uh, the first option was Mexico, then Chile. But they don't want it, doesn't want the UNCTAD in uh, Chile because it was the government of Salvador Allende. And even they did a an, uh, an meeting of the uh, OEA, the American Organization of States, at the same time the UNCTAD in Chile because uh, the persons can be in the two places at the same time. They, they did a meeting of uh, organization of uh, American states in Washington at the same time the UNCTAD was in Chile. For for instance, for example, uh, uh, it's what not easy this discussion in Chile because have many symbolic mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, place because it was made in this moment. But at the same time, for example, um, the socialist Germany doesn't have representation in this moment. And in this moment, uh, the socialist uh, countries have the CAME, the C A M E, the the economic um, co the economic agreement between the socialist uh, countries, and this organization have to be in UNCTAD in Chile, and they elected a German from socialist Germany because they can have someone from socialist Germany in this meeting because uh, socialist Germany is not a part of the United Nations in this moment. And you can see all this kind of uh, situation, very, very interesting. In one side, you can see the Sikho Marshall talking about the limits of growth, but at the same time, you can see the people in India or the Mid and Mid Orient talking, why is there are nobody from socialist Germany here, et, et cetera. And, and all this context is in Latin America, in this, in this very weird, situation of Latin America after the Second World War until the early 70s, because the people here with all the instability anyway, they want to do the, an utopical modernity. It was not possible uh, in, in other places and, and continue uh, in many situations that is not possible after the 70s. So we think, for example, if the, the boys learn to to do programming schools in the early 70s. What happened with Chile today if they began this kind of work in the 70s? But this kind of project was stopped with the military push. What happened if 50 years ago, 50 years in the past, we, we did that, we continue with this kind of project. We never going to know it, but this kind of project was only, Chile was 50 times poorer than today, but under the development model, no growing model. But the growing began in the 70s and every changes and we doesn't have nothing about technology today. We have six, 60 universities and the OCDE says in Chile only the 2% of the people understand the written information. So <laughs> and it's very, which kind of society of information we can have with, with this kind of percent? Uh, only uh, from money from commodities so it's very easy to manage the people so uh, are very big but the growing is better than 50 years ago no say i don't know the people used to show this so 
but uh, it's very interesting that they ask the question about the aesthetics because uh, given CF, uh, using the background from the HFU you own with the Max Benz ideas about cybernetics, with the horse retail ideas about systemic design, with the um, materialistic dialectic interpretation of Gibbon Siepe, he tried to found how to calculate the value of use of the aesthetics. And the answer was the concept of, of interface, because interface was uh, very important for a project for like uh, the cyber scene, because the is what can be or not successful in the interaction design. But the same given CF or all this or all these kind of people says this kind of experiments uh, is only possible in this very strange context of Latin America in those years. Uh, stuff for real says uh, stuff for real arrived like like an owner of uh, richest empress uh, enterprise so companies. And then turned in a hippie. So <laughs> he, he was a very important change when when Salvador Allende says, "Ah, the system five, the people." Ah, oh, oh, that moment for Salvador was very uh, important in his life. He he never think uh, a president says we we have this kind of radical hierarchical model for the second order cybernetics, and then he tried to do this model in the another experience in Peru or Uruguay or, Me or Mexico. Leah, you want to? Yes, I wanted to pick up something that um, David, um, you, we spoke about in our last conversation and, and you also mentioned in your article and, and now um, Kenny will ask as well about the labor relations. Um, and I, I'd love us if we, I think we have some time left to speak a little bit about this as well, because if I understood you right, um, the building, uh, the construction of the building of Untag 3 also was so fast, so extremely fast, because um, they did not work in a classical hierarchical structure from planners and technicians to the workers, but try to implement this heterarchy kind of, um, to, to work together, each autonomous uh, kind of um, group um, with their task and then come together and um, develop among technicians, workers and planners um, how to manage the construction site. Um, if, if I understand it right, if I understand it right, then maybe you can speak a little bit more um, about this kind of um, applied cybernetics on labor management. Um, that would be interesting to hear because I was thinking it's also connected um, to how was um, some sort of like liberation or withdrawal from alienation understood in the 70s um, in socialist Chile. Well, um, there are three points in this. First, in the 20s, we have a very strong movement about the active school. The active schools were of the background, epistemological background for the co-op design. So this movement uh, was the first who did a national mo movement for change the education under the active school and hierarchical model. Inside this, for example, in the 1978, we have a reform in the art school in, into a design school with influence from the Russian Kutemas, for example. Uh, but this history was borrowed, but they they give this background from the active school from the 20s. So then the active school, you can use it in any field. Uh, was, a, was a memory from the 20s for the 40s. And when the student did the new educational model in the 40s and the architectural school was very hierarchical, not only for the Tibor Weiner influence from the COP design because they know about the active school from the 20s, from their own experience. And all the education in, in the architecture school in the 40s, 50s, and 60s was under this hierarchical horizontal model. They asked to the people, the homeless, uh, what they need, and they did the design together. So they have different interpretations of COP design in the arch architecture practice in team works, so the centralized working, so about the national needs. So in the 50s, very strong in the 50s, 
ideology in the architects in the 50s, 60s. And in the late 50s, even uh, the private uh, companies use a model with the name of uh, assembly of workers, some, where every person in the project, in the private companies, uh, discuss and take decisions about the project with this methodology in the late 60s with this, the Siama uh, um, half special name, but uh, all, all the workers in a meeting with all the technicians discuss every aspect about the project. So, and this model did possible to do very two very important uh, buildings in the late 70s, 60s, very fast. And this company get the project from the UGNTAT because they have this, this background. And this background, this horizontal background with the workers and technicians in the late 60s with the company Desco, then uh, was very easy for they learn what Helmholtz tried to do with the new technologies and PERT system. So uh, he, he used the, the new technology, but they have uh, before the horizontal methodology for, for take decisions between technicians and techniques and workers. So, and, and everybody was in some kind of union from the 50s. So, uh, and, and all this was uh, stopped after the military coup because the, the unions and the professional association uh, disappears, the political parties disappears. Every, but in the, um, these new laws in the 50s says the um, neighborhood unit have a program with the same people living the neighborhood unit with the association for the management of the neighborhood human uh, neighborhood units so in the 60s 70s was a kind of culture uh, about a civic association working uh, between the state the private in, uh, initiatives and personal initiatives uh, that's what I call organic, maybe not the right uh, concept, but, but well, they take many uh, models from the organic. <laughs> they talk about sales or the city like a living organism, et cetera, or managing organic management models. So uh, even after the after 1973, a group of architects some of them was uh, happy with the military coup. Uh, they did a book to the military junta. They give a book with, to the military generals, trying to explain they have to continue with this concept about the city designing as a living system. But a few months later, uh, the military junta uh, dissolved the, the legal uh, properties of this organization of professional architects and put a model where only the free trade beside the public uh, space and the, the, the state doesn't do nothing. So, But even you can see this, uh, even the people from the right in the 70s uh, was thinking in this kind of systemic horizontal model, <laughs> uh, did it by 30 years. So, and in each moment, uh, was a very special moment, but with this successful example of the UNTAC buildings in 10 months, in this horizontal way, where the, the workers help introduce uh, information for the ABM cards with the PERTS and CPM models. So, uh, for example, the successful example of this was very good when uh, Salvador Allende wants the workers the unions uh, management the the state company. So this 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 uh, was successful in the UNTAD construction. That I, I was right. The the unions can manage the national industry. So you can see they were successful in the. We can continue doing this with the nationalization of the industry because the unions can do a right management. You can see they did it in the UNTAD construction. So well. And that continue even because that's a hierarchical mm -hmm. model. The, the, the people, the same workers uh, do the management of the industry. So 
that and, that, and that the workers, will go out of the end. So, sorry. I'm sorry. And also applied the com computing system basically to manage. They the they can they only can in the national industry, but well, they, they help to the computing uh, prospective model in the UNCTAD. So, mm -hmm. yes. But then in the national industries with the CyberSync project, they can do uh, no many much experience because, because the CyberSync project really starts in the 1973. But they did little, uh, the, the, the unions was um, doing the management on the national industries uh, in an analogical model. So, but they did it in, in, in 1972, 1973. So, mm -hmm. and they did two experience with a, a computing model in the north of the city and in the south of the city, like little experience then Sarah City want to do in all the country then. But they began to do little examples uh, 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 because the, the system is going to be start in September 1973. <laughs> All the system, they, they only can do little experience before with computing. So, mm -hmm. But they, they did management, decentralized management anyway with the unions in the national industry. Yeah. Two years at least. Shall we, um, I see Adrien's hand up and maybe then we can do another round. I don't know if Kenny also wants to comment on something and uh, then I can add something and to collect um, some th some thoughts and questions. Okay, Doreen. Okay, thank you so much, David. Really, it was really, really compelling. Also the details that you've brought in and the different also how, what, who informed whom and it was really very fascinating. Um, I think I have a couple of points or like three points because I would like to understand a bit but still uh, what that kind of um, interaction or intersection of cybernetics with, you know, society, what that really, um, where could we situate that? You mentioned earlier on that it has been an interface between what you just said, workers, technicians, um, and neighbor communities. So was this an interface to improve or enhance the um, a, a better a better communication or better organization and better kind of labor conditions? I'm asking that because what we figured out in the East German kind of um, Marxist ethics of cybernetics, this is, you know, the person I've been thinking with is Franz Löser, who was a philosopher, who was interested in the improvement of a collective communication uh, between collectives. I mean, you know, to create a model and an ethics um, through cybernetics that would improve uh, and optimize communication, collective communication. So this was a really mm -hmm. important principle between workers, technicians, and society or community. And if did I understand that correctly, that this was, you know, a major aspect, cybersyn on one side, but also the models that you introduced in terms of cybernetics in Chile, socialist Chile. Um, this is one question, you know, or is it like really transhumanism to uh, allow... <sighs> like, you know, to have machines taking over, like cybernetics taking over or like helping out with uh, forms of labor um, towards an idea of society that does not have to bother anymore with certain kind of serial production. I think this is what I not quite fully, fully kind of grasp it, grasped. And then to come back to the building and to the beautiful sculpture by the artist um, uh, for a fourth world, where uh, this is, you know, uh, I mean, on one shape in form of architecture models, but also who is the fourth world? Today we are discussing indigenous knowledges as fourth world. And I wonder, mm -hmm. was this at stake back then in the in this early 70s? I mean, what was the fourth world? Who Who are they? Who is the fourth world? 
Oh. And that's something, um, uh, you know, I just would like to, to, to understand, you know, I mean, what was it discussed in the early 70s or what we discussed in today with indigenous communities, indigenous technologies as fourth world. Is this something that already was at stake in the early 70s? Well, uh, I need to say uh, first, uh, the first uh, socialist cybernetic experience in Latin America, maybe not the Chilean experience in the 70s. I think was the, the experience of Jacobo Arbenz uh, in Guatemala in the early 50s. So, Can you elaborate on that? That's, uh... I, Jacobo Arbenz, the president of Guatemala in the early 50s, he, he did a nationalization of the, the commodities and he, he put a computer made by the New Zealand engineer uh, Williams in the National Bank of, of uh, Guatemala for the management of the economy and, the, and to do prospective of the economy. But in this kind of democratic socialist model or socialist model for, uh, for uh, Guatemala in the early 50s. And the CIA did a military push in the 50s with this regime and finished this model set them. And then Emmanuel Sadowski, who was a communist in the 40s, did this framework in Argentina in the 50s and early 60s, because first he began to do uh, development inside the public university for do a national agency of computing about the national needs. But all this was stopped in 1966 with a military push in Argentina with support from the United States. So, and, and I try to say uh, they were looking for a, some kind of technological socialism before Allende. Maybe uh, the 70s was the more complex or so, but was not the first. They came from a history. So, And in general terms, in Latin America from the 20s until the 70s, we were trying to do our own model of uh, development. So we very uh, difficult, but you can kind, it's very easy to see a, a line from the 20s to the 70s in all the countries of Latin America about an own model of uh, development. But uh, and that's where uh, born the Economical Commission of the United Nations in Chile or in the 60s or in Africa or in Asia, born with this intention uh, to do a, a own economical politics so, for development. But the UNCTAD was a project for, for to do a kind of interface uh, between the Latin American modernity projects with all the third world. So, and, and that's what, that's very difficult, but it's very heterogeneous. <laughs> the, the third world in those years was, was very different situation in different countries, but what's the main objective? If you can remember, for example, Tomás Maldonado in the HFG own, the Argentinian dean of the HFG, the Hochschule for Gestaltung in all, yeah. Um, he believed in the dialectical materialism. He believed in the Hannes Meyer model, but he doesn't believe communist Soviet model. So, and and he thinks a uh, dialectical materialism interpretation in the design uh, speech is another kind of dialectical materialism. And that is was the influence in Gibbon Siev, for example. And Gibbon Siev, when he arrived to Chile in the late of the 60s, a group of students from the design school go to work with him. But Bon Siev uh, says to them, if you want work with me first, you have to go to study political economy. Then when you understand the system under the laws of the political economy, in the economic faculty, you can came to do design, industrial design with me in the national agency. And in, inside these discussions, they began to think how to do the, calculate the, the, the user's value of the aesthetics 
and finishing with this concept of interface bit. But uh, I, I have this translation published of this uh, discussion because he published it in Spanish in Chile, but I, I published it in the EA and Society Journal uh, the last year. So I did about this uh, co host. He tried to do this interface concept with ideas from the political economy, how to do a, a calculation of the aesthetic space for to do uh, for for do working all these uh, productional systems so but but i think all of them uh, things uh, this is not possible to do in in europe in this moment in the 70s so uh, it's an it's a very strange model and only in the 20s at least in chile mexico so and in this moment in the late 60s and 70s you can see at the same time a really interest in the vernacular culture. Vernacular, because when the cultural center, I did I did an abstract, but the cultural center goal, uh, it depends of, of the cultural means. Says uh, this cultural center is for the popular culture, is for do strongest the the popular culture. That means the pre-Columbian culture, the American culture, and at the same time, uh, all the, the goals of the development from the global south, at the same time. And, and you can see uh, how only in the late of the 60s and the, the, um, the first 70s, and in the 20s, uh, you can see how inside the main institutions, they were talking, which is our vernacular culture. Uh, uh, they were looking at the avant-garde from Europe or United States, but they were looking not only at COVID, they are looking for a synthesis with the local culture. But you can look at this clear in the 20s and in the early 70s and late 60s, inside all this discussion. How can be possible this synthesis? But it's clear, institutional, it wasn't an institutional goal in this moment, so not in another moment. Thank you, David. Um, I'm just uh, taking the word because I think um, Kenny has another appointment and uh, so we have to like uh, slowly um, close down. Um, also with like a lot of uh, new um, themes and questions popped up. Um, I'll also, I'll just send you my questions um, later on. Um, but I wanted to um, hand over kind of um, once more to to Kenny and maybe to to Doreen um, to make uh, some some last uh, comments, um, and then we can also wait after Kenny left, of course, further uh, the discussion. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'll keep it uh, very brief, but please don't feel uh, you know don't stop uh, just for me because I have to go in a few minutes, but I think what, what this really shows and also following from the Reed's question is this, uh, for me, a very interesting tension between this fourth world of, let's say, socialist internationalism or socialist globalization, maybe, and then um, the kind of, uh, you know, relationality of indigenous and, you know, other um, let's say so, uh, political projects that are, that, that are at work um and have been at work and thinking about alternatives uh since uh this this moment so um for me it shows that there isn't this kind of singular political epistemology um of internationalism or relationality perhaps um but that we we have to think about these tensions and and take them seriously uh perhaps not see everything as uh, part of a singular um alternative um um yeah and i don't know this is these are my very uh ill-formed uh, final remarks to continue thinking thank you so much uh david for your inspiring talk um <laughs> see how uh this has been a very interesting conversation with uh with leah considering her interests in cybernetics, um, but also uh, thinking uh, decoloniality and what that means, both in terms of uh, 
um, methods to look at a, at, a, at a historical past and the kinds of forces uh, at work in that past. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. OK. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> Maybe the, the sculpture, I want to say a last thing. The, the sculpture, the blue sculpture, uh, if you see this sculpture, uh, you can understand it, it's, it's a globe, no? Mm -hmm. It's a globe. That, that's, it's easy to understand what you think is a fourth word because we are going to do a fourth word. So, but if you know a little about the Chilean culture or mm -hmm. the, the Peruvian, Bolivian, Chilean culture, you can see at the same time if the system of representation of the reality from the the indigenous culture from the cross of the south the the aka uh, uh, capanas I, I forget the exactly word but but the, if the system of the representation you can find this in Bolivia Peru and Chile in in, in Aymaras or Mapuche people because it's, it's a system where uh, it's similar like the the, the Euclidean uh, geometric, but it's not the same because the the human the human being is, is between the 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 father sun and the mother moon and, and after the the mother earth and you are inside this cross this system this geometrical mm -hmm. system from the the Andinian cross Andinian cross. If if you uh, and and uh, we uh, the the Mapuche in Chile use this uh, geometric form for for uh, music instruments for religious uh, uh, ceremonies. So, and if you live in the south of Chile, you recognize this form in the in the sculptures at the same time, and and that's what you can see in the twenties and then in this moment in the early seventies, how to do a synthesis between these these two kinds of representational system of, of reality so uh, mm -hmm. it's not we can we can return to the past to the pre-columbian past but it's, it's not enough the copy from the industrial countries and uh, uh, <laughs> explained it very clear in the magazines in the intake in those years so the, the the copy doesn't work here so and and the goal is to do the synthesis between the the local vernacular culture with the the tools from another countries, but doing the interpretation we need here. So, uh, and and the sculpture uh, is the same you can found in in the new school of art in nineteen seventy eight. They were looking for this synthesis. So, and no more after the seventies, <laughs> at least in Chile. Yeah. Now the model is Miami here, so. <laughs> can, can I still ask a question, Leah, or how would you like to do it? I know. Um, or is sure, time sure, running go ahead. Or is right time, time running out, we, really? yeah. Um, if, if David has a, a couple of more minutes, um, we can... We can continue for a moment. Um, of course, you have, have one more also. question and uh, say goodbye to Kenny. Thanks again. Thank you. Sorry, I have to leave. Hope uh, we have another occasion to, to talk soon. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye. Also, you have a seminar, David, don't you? So? You have a talk. You have a talk. Gosh, then. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. No, then maybe. Uh, then I, I, I can. I just really interested in the way you open up the nineteen twenties, nineteen seventies, and the independence of Chile. I mean, is in the in the early is in the early nineteenth um, century, and how, you know, why the nineteen twenties become so pertinent and so important. So that I think was uh, how do you connect these twenties with the seventies, or like you just explained this very beautifully. But no, then I get a better sense also this cosmological system, this sculpture that speaks so much to cosmological uh, knowledge systems with the moon, the earth, and the indigenous knowledges and how you situate there this kind of fourth world, if I understood correctly, in relation to technology cybernetics. 
I just wanted to get that clear whether I understood this correctly, but I think um, I got it now. Yeah, I don't want to take more time. Thank you. Also for me, thank you, uh, <laughs> thank David, you for, um, for, for the background of the, uh, the design principles of the fourth world sculpture again by Carlos Otusa, because um, I, at least I can speak for myself. Um, First, I see the the modernist um, European aesthetics in it, and I'm I'm blind for seeing um, the how it relates to more cosmological worldviews, to um, vernacular local um, knowledge systems. Right, like my how I um, look yeah. perceive this this artwork. Um, I'm blind for for seeing this, so um, that's very valuable. Thank you so much. Yes, I I told you a very interesting thing for me. For example, in the newspapers in those years, uh, in the leftist press, I can read many much about the people from the, the socialist countries from Europe or from India or from etc. Mm -hmm. And in the right press, I can read about France or United States. But for example, it's very strange for me, nobody did interviews to the people from Africa. And, and I know the people from the countries from Africa they did support because they won the co the conference in Chile in and not the United States, mm -hmm. but the, the it's another difference about what the people was understanding about the common goals. So, yeah, which, which countries? Which countries from Africa do you know when it came to Chile at that point? Oh, uh, many, many. <laughs> I, I I in in the document I I did a list of the the head of any commissions of any in in the document or online i i did a list the names of every person from the head of each commission for because from japan there were 20 persons and from nigeria um, south africa came two persons or three but uh, but you can see the the list with the names in the in the document uh, but what i think is strange I know the the people from Africa says uh, this conference has to be in, in the third world, being in Chile during the socialist government. But when they came to Chile, nobody uh, did uh, interviews with nobody talked with them in the press. So, what's strange for me that that because they were a very important support for for us for the conference. Uh, but at the same time, in the leftist press, I can see uh, all the people from Poland, uh, uh, Yugoslavia, from Soviet Union, talking in the leftist press. So at the same time, uh, in the right press, from the people talking from the United States or from England. So, so. but uh, I'm from India, I'm from Japan, but not no many people take care from the representatives from from africa that that was very no, no very at least i was hoping in the leftist press they can be, be interviewed interviewed uh, I, I hope that but but was very difficult indeed in this moment when i i give the document for public discussions I want to get more information what they talk about in the conference because it was a very big group from different countries from Africa. And and there are many there are no many much information, but they they talk in the conference. So in, in contrast with the people from from Soviet communist or, or socialist or capitalist Europe. So I, I have many interviews from these people. In, uh, what they talk in the conference so thank you david thank and you. also for this uh last a bit more react i think critical um statement on on UNCTAD 3 because we spoke or you spoke a lot about um also flattening hierarchies part of um UNCTAD 3 um creating a fourth world with the latin american world model but at the same time um there's this uh, hierarchy within the third world um and questions of race also appear and representation um, that uh, where where Latin America had another dominance, I think, still at the at the time. Um, but yeah, if if uh, everyone agrees, I think it was a fantastic uh, session and and conversation. And uh, 
I hope we can continue our exchange via email. Um, and we should all go into a, a, a weekend of um, recover and, uh, and relaxation, I propose. Really, really thank you for the exchange. Really, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Leo.